we find that God blesses us and saves us in more than one way. And as we, uh, Lord willing, finish this story, this historical account of Ruth and Boaz, I believe you'll see also, as a Christian, um, not only do we see Ruth redeemed by Boaz, but you can see how you are redeemed by Christ. And if you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, then I hope that this morning you'll pay attention to God's Word, be open-minded, and have your heart open to what the Holy Spirit may whisper to you. And uh, this time I'd ask, would you just bow your heads for a moment as we ask God to bless this time we have together. Father God, thank you so much for the privilege and the honor to be here to share your word with your people. Father, I echo the sentiments of the prayers in Sunday school and even the ones that opened up this service, Father. I pray that you just call out to the lost and they respond in faith. I pray you revive the heart so that we uh, have a, a fervor. Uh, for your word, for a relationship with you, for worship, and for service. Father, I pray for the one who may be lukewarm, or the many that may be lukewarm in here. Father, I pray that you call out to them, and by the cleansing of the Spirit and of the Word, Father, that they uh, recognize a need to rededicate themselves to you, Father, and I pray they do so. Father, use this time that we have together to speak to your people, to revive your church, and to equip us to go out into this world as we face the hazards and the perils. And Father, as we hopefully point people to Jesus, that you equip us and you strengthen us to do just that. I ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. So to catch us back up, to, to refresh us about what's going on in the book of Ruth, you may recall that we read about Ruth's loyalty in the return of her and Naomi uh, to Bethlehem. Uh, you might recall that after the deaths of her, her husband and her sons, uh, Naomi decides that she's going to return to Bethlehem and Ruth, showing great loyalty, pledges to stay with Naomi, saying, uh, Thy people shall be my people and thy God shall be my God and accompanies her back. And it was there we find that they had normal concerns because here they are, two widows, with uh, very little promise of how they would depend uh, or how they would depend on each other or how they would provide for themselves once they got back to Bethlehem. But we read about gleaning and finding favor in the eyes of Boaz. To support themselves, Ruth gleans the fields of Boaz, a kind and wealthy relative of Naomi's uh, now deceased hus husband, Elimelech. And Boaz notices Ruth's dedication uh, to Naomi... He ensures her safety, and he invites her to continue gleaning in his fields. He, he provides, he is charitable, he gives a way for her to support herself or at least feed her and her mother-in-law, Naomi. We then read about a proposal and a promise being at the feet of Boaz. Uh, following Naomi's advice, Ruth approaches Boaz on the threshing floor, asking him to act as her redeemer. And Boaz praises her character and promises to fulfill this role if a closer relative of Elimelech declines, ensuring Ruth and Naomi's protection and provision. We talked about this before, but just as a reminder, if you weren't here before or you forgot about it, in these times it was not uncommon when a young lady was widowed that the next of kin or the closest relative would assume the role of caring for that widow. And if the widow had children, their children as well. So that brings us to where we're at this morning, Ruth chapter 3, verse 14. Hopefully you found it. If you didn't, that's okay. I'll read it to you. Here's what God's Word tells us. And she lay at his feet until morning, and she rose up before one could know another. And he said, Let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. Also, he said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her, and she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. And he said, These six measures of barley gave he me, for he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Verse 18. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. Look, I want you to first notice how Boaz provides provision, but God also provides provision for His people. 
So we see Ruth leaving the threshing floor. Now, when she departs in the early hours, she carries with her not just promises from Boaz, not just talk, not just a bunch of empty words, but she leaves with a substantial amount of gifts with estimates of being between 60 and 90 pounds of barley. Look, I want you to understand something this morning. If you're a Christian, if you're toying with the idea of being a Christian, if you're just confused, you've been a Christian for a long time, and you just feel for some reason God is not working in your life right now, I want you to understand something. God has promised you many things. You don't know what they are? Read His Word. They are filled with the promises that were given to you and given to me. And those promises are not just empty words. Those promises are not just things things to make you think that he's going to help you and that he won't. No, just like Ruth departed that uh, threshing floor with provision, just like she departed that threshing floor with something more than words, you and I, Christian, you and I, unbeliever, if you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, have tangible benefits of being a Christian. Can somebody give me an amen? If God has provided for you this morning, are you thankful for it? Because we don't serve a God who's full of empty promises. We don't serve a God who does not show us and reveal Himself to us. No, we serve a God that goes beyond words and actually fulfills the things and, and meets the needs of His people. Now, Boaz's explanation clarifies his motives. Initially, it seemed the barley might be a cover story or a gesture of good faith. I mentioned before that it was very common for uh, uh, ladies to come and approach men on the threshing floor after they worked uh, all day. But that's not what this was. This wasn't giving her a gift as in saying there was a reason that she was on the threshing floor to, make, to keep up appearances that nothing uh, uh, underhanded was going on. Instead, Boaz intended Ruth to not return empty-handed countering Naomi's early bitterness about her emptiness inside. You may recall in chapter 1 we read that when Naomi and Ruth came back from Moab and they got to Bethlehem, they asked, the people of Bethlehem asked, is this Ruth who left with so much? And she said, I came back with nothing. She was bitter, she was hurt, she lost her husband, she lost her sons, and she, stayed, she was coming back from a foreign land empty-handed. What Boaz was doing was he was giving Ruth something to give to her mother-in-law to show her that it was not all hopeless, that she was not empty, that there were still reasons to have hope. And this morning, I don't know where you're at on your spiritual journey, but I can promise you this. If you cling to the words of God, if you take hold of the things that Jesus has promised you, you too have hope. You are not empty-handed. You are not or should not be bitter because we have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Boaz's concern for Naomi is significant, is displayed by the giving of gifts to Ruth. His kinsman redeemer duty ties him to Naomi through her deceased husband, Elimelech. I just mentioned how the next of kin would take care of the widows and the widow's family and the children in the event that the husband had died. He also acknowledges Naomi's strategic role in orchestrating this plan. He understands that she encouraged Ruth to come there to be redeemed, highlighting her importance and the role she played in these unfolding events. But I have to get back to this 60 to 90 pounds of barley. I mean, can you imagine Ruth walking back through town, her outer cloak, when it says he measures, uh, they wore two cloaks, the outer cloak he, he has her hold out, fills that cloak with all this barley, being a clear indication of this recent encounter. And, and, and while she's coming back with all these gifts, and while she's coming back with all this provision, so they don't have to worry about what they're going to eat, they don't have to worry about how they're going to provide for themselves, picture Naomi waiting to hear what took place on the threshing floor. Perhaps restless, even anxious, awaiting Ruth's return. 
Christian, let me tell you something. There are a lot of times it's easy for us to become restless. It's easy for us to become anxious because we do not know what tomorrow holds. We do not know if we'll have our job next week. We do not know what that doctor's report may say. We do not know if somebody is going to cross the yellow line when we get out on that road and smash into the front of us. But what we do know if we have Jesus is that it's all going to work out for the good. It's all going to work out for the best. Look, when she gets back home to Naomi, Naomi asks, Who are you, my daughter? Now, was this just a mistake in an identity? Did she get her hair done on the way back home so that, you know, while she was carrying all that barley? No. What it means, Ruth's response is straightforward and full of meaning. Here's what happens, and, and, and look at what Boaz gave me. She came back a completely different person because she knows that now she is on the path to redemption. Christian, this morning, if you are walking around like the world has beaten you down, I'm not saying that life isn't hard, and I'm not saying that problems won't come, and I'm not saying you won't go through trials, but what I am saying to you is when those things happen, even if you have temporarily lapses of judgment where you lash out, even when you have times and bouts of depression, understand this, a person should still be able to look at your life and say, wow, there is something different about the way they respond to adversity. And why? Because Christian, you and I, once again, have Jesus Christ. When the world has no hope, when the world says, you know what, Live for today because you're not going to be here tomorrow. When the world tells you that there is no reason to have a smile, understand the Lord Jesus Christ is all the reason to smile you need. Here, Naomi asks, who is this? Because she sees that something has changed. There is something different about Ruth who is coming back to her. Why? Because Ruth knows she is going to be redeemed. And Christian, if you're redeemed this morning, there should be a happiness about you. There should be a peace which the Bible tells us passes all understanding in your mind. I'm not going to say every day is sunshine and rainbows, but I'm going to say at the end of the day, you should know and you should recall and you should rest in the fact that Jesus has you. Right now, when problems arise, when you mess up, He advocates to the Father to say, that's okay, put this one on me. When we can't figure out what's going on or why God's allowing things to happen in our life, look at Romans 8.28. Brother Randy, he likes quoting this one a lot. We know that all things work together for those who love God according to His purpose. We can put faith and trust in God knowing that whatever He sends our way and whatever He allows happen to us, just like Job in the Old Testament, we know that we may go through what we perceive as proverbial hell on earth, but at the end of the time, we'll be, we are redeemed. We will be restored. And we can have hope in every single bit of that. Naomi's advice to Ruth. So, so uh, Ruth gets back. Naomi asks who she is. And Naomi advises Ruth to stay calm because Boaz won't rest until he completes her redemption. And her advice to Ruth is this. Wait it out. And by the way, that contrasts with her earlier proactive directions to Ruth. Ruth, having done all she could, must trust Boaz to resolve the matter, reflecting Naomi's confidence in Boaz as well as God at work. Christian, if you have put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you do not have to try to be better. You have to follow Jesus. Unbeliever, this morning, if you think somehow you have to clean yourself up before coming to God, understand the worst person that you can imagine. Take every sin you've committed, the worst sin you committed. I don't care. Oh, I do care. But even if you murdered someone this morning, understand this. If you truly approach God in a way that's repentant, eschewth evil, that's not saying just don't like it. That means run away from it. If you're in that place, understand this, it doesn't matter how filthy or dirty or how uh, uh, moral insolvent you are. God can redeem you and will redeem you if you come seeking Him. We don't have to worry about doing anything else. God will do the heavy lifting. All we have to do is be obedient. And that is what Naomi is saying to Ruth. Just wait it out. 
Boaz will get this worked out. Look, Christian, God gives you multiple assurances that you belong to Him. This morning, if you're confused and you say, I don't know if I'm saved. If you're here this morning and you say, you know, I felt felt different a long time ago. My worship felt different. I felt like God was close. If that's you this morning, understand this. You can know right now if you're one of His or not. But don't take my word for it. Let me show you in Scripture. See, if you're one of His, then God speaks to you on the inside. Romans chapter 8, verse 16, The Spirit itself beareth witness within our spirit that we are the children of God. If you never feel God's leading, if you never hear God speaking, let me tell you something. It's not because He's not doing it. But I guarantee you the person who says they don't hear God or God doesn't direct them, they're lacking in Bible study, they're lacking in prayer life, and they're lacking in true Christian fellowship. But you know what's a part of true Christian fellowship? is having a brother and sister in Christ who loves you enough to hold you accountable. And Christian this morning, you, if you're faithful to God, understand this, it's a part, it's your job, it's my job. To hold our brothers and sisters accountable, to encourage them, and to remind them of what God's Word says. And sometimes you'll take criticism. I've been slandered and smeared and and put all over the internet because I held people accountable. But guess what? Now woe is me. I'm thankful because I honored God and I can sleep easy at night. This morning I say this to you. God will speak to you on the inside. God will lead you if you're one of His. But not only does He speak to you on... Well, let me go before I move any further. The book of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Here's another verse. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For He has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So if you still feel God's leading... Look, uh, the question of apostasy and free will Baptist and Arminianism comes up frequently. If you're not familiar with that, look, free will Baptist, Arminians, we believe that you have the ability to reject God even after you have been enlightened. Why? Because your free will does not dissipate after you get saved. All right? But there are people who often wonder, well, can I lose my salvation? Well, you can't lose it like you do uh, a set of keys. Brother West loses his keys every couple of weeks. Brother finds them every time. Usually I say Tanya, but I haven't heard you lose yours in a while. We don't believe you can lose your salvation, but we believe you can reject God. But understand this. I've had people ask me, well, how do I know if I've gotten to a place where I've rejected God? And let me let you in on a little secret. If you are concerned that you may be in a place where you've rejected God, you haven't rejected God. Because if you did, you would not care at all. You wouldn't care what he thinks of you. You wouldn't care what others think of you. You would be indifferent when it came to following the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, not only does God speak to you when you're one of His, but He also blesses you. He speaks to you on the inside and He blesses you on the outside. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, we read, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you should drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Also, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, we read a little further down, verses 32 and 33. Your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Look, if you're faithfully following the Lord Jesus Christ, you're certainly going to know it. It's not going to be guesswork. You don't have to think about it. I'm going to tell a story about someone. I'll leave their name out. But uh, I'll never forget, I was sick at home in bed with the flu. Okay, And I can say this because I'm a big boy, so y'all are just going to have to suck it up if you get offended. I was sick in bed with the flu. And there was a particular family member, we'll loosely say family member at that time, who said that they needed to go to a doctor. They were bad off. So I got out of the bed. I traveled to their house. I picked them up and I took them to the doctor. I literally fell asleep. I was running a fever. I fell asleep out in the car, and they finally came back to the car. And I was driving them home, and I said, not for nothing. They looked perfectly fine to me. I said, not for nothing. What's going on that would make you have to go to the doctor today? 
Now, I wasn't a Christian at this time. But Brother Randy, or Brother Jeremy, what they said to me almost made me swerve off the car or off the road because I was that mad. They said, I went to the doctor just to find out if I was overweight. Now, let me, let me tell you something, okay? <laughs> this person wasn't as big as I am, okay? But this wasn't Brother Parker Manning, okay? This wasn't Brother Xavier Brooks. Uh, you can look at this person. You didn't have to be a doctor, okay? I know you need to be a biologist to tell the difference between a male and female these days. But you didn't have to be no scientist to know this person was heavy, okay? But they ran me out of bed with the flu to take them to a doctor to tell them that they were overweight. They're not in here, but one of the reasons that they did uh, A person that's in this house this morning, uh, it's their fault that I was the one out of bed, loosely. Look, I say this, I promise I had an example, and I promise I had an illustration for that. I just had to get that off my chest this morning. I'm confessing it to you all these years later. No, look, I share that with you. Because you're going to know. You are going to know if you're one of God's. No more than that person had to guess, and they may have, in all fairness to them, they may have literally not had a clue that they were in the condition they were in. We call that denial. But Christian, this morning, unbeliever this morning, you know in your heart of hearts if you're within the will of God. And if you find yourself and it's revealing to yourself, if you see now that you're not, stop putting it off. You are one prayer away from being right back in the fold with God. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. All you have to do, you're one prayer away. Let's keep going for time's sake. You still in the book of Ruth, do me a favor. Turn to chapter 4 and look for verse 1. And here's what God's word tells us. Then went Boaz up to the gate and set him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Oh, su such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and, sit, or and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land which was our brother's Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee. And I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz, or rather then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar my uh, own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the manner in the former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing, for to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. Look, Boaz, we can see the practice of respect. We talked about integrity in business a couple of, couple of sermons back in this series. But here we see the general practice of respect. Boaz does the right thing by showing respect to the nearest kinsman because after all, it was the nearest kinsman's place to assume uh, uh, the family, also the family's possessions. In this case, he specifically mentions a parcel of land which Naomi had to sell because she could not keep it. It was Elimelech's. In crucial matters like marriage and divorce or property transactions, the Jewish tradition called for a greater number of witnesses to ensure validity of the agreement. I'm going to tell you sometimes I wish that was a practice today. There's conversations that I've had and people have turned around and said I didn't have them. I wish we would have had them right here in front of the church. Why? Because then there would be no question. They were kind of smart because they went in front of a bunch of people and, and, and entered into agreements and, and things. But 
Instead of the usual two or three witnesses, which we're familiar with, like for instance, when the Gospel of Matthew talks about conflict resolution of going to the person and them alone, and they won't hear you out, then you take two or three witnesses and they won't hear you out either. You take them before the church. Look, in this case, instead of the usual two or three witnesses, ten respected elders from the community were brought in to witness and validate the proceedings, emphasizing the significance and seriousness of these important events. Boaz informs Ruth of a closer relative who has the first right to redeem her. And this person must meet the requirements of the relationship and resources and be willing to redeem. Now the closer relative who Boaz sought out decided against redeeming the land and and also Ruth and subsequently Naomi because he saw that it, was, it would disrupt his own inheritance. Notice, he was willing to help out this closer relative if it didn't hurt his financial situation. Look, if you want to truly help somebody out, I'm not saying you've got to put yourself in harm's way, but if you're truly trying to help somebody out, you're not looking, looking for what's in it for you. You're doing it because you want to help. This closer relative was concerned that if he married Ruth and had a child with her, that child would inherit the property but bear the name of her late husband rather than his own. And when he, and, and, and he also likely thought the land might need to be split among his own children from a previous marriage, so he gave up his right, allowing Boaz to take it on, clearing the way for Boaz's marriage to Ruth. He symbolically finishes conversation, which I think is great. From now on, I want to go to a courtroom and I want to do something. David, you got to sell me like a little corner of your property. Because I want to see the people that are in that church. When you sell me that little corner of property, I just pop my shoe off and hand it to you, brother. Can you? I, I don't know what that custom's about, but I love it. He symbolically finishes this conversation of passing the right to Boaz by removing his shoe. So what does that mean for you and I? If you're agreeable to the person in front of you, I want you to take your shoe off right now. None of y'all are agreeable with the person in front of you. I hope I heard a shoe drop. No, keep your shoes on. For, for, Lord, keep your shoes on. Well, you can take your shoes off. We can have a foot washing service. See how quick people jet out after this sermon. Now, what does that mean for, for you and I? If you were to consider your redemption being based off of Jesus, which hopefully you do if you were saved this morning, because Jesus told us clearly He's the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father but who? By Him. If your redemption is being based on Jesus or His figurative nearest kinsman, then you would have to arrive to the realization of going to his nearest kinsman, what would Jesus' nearest kinsman be? The law. Because before Christ, what did you have to do? You had to keep and observe the law. Jesus served as the ultimate sacrifice and presented the possibility of redeeming you this morning. If you were to be reliant upon redemption of the nearest kinsman, then you would be relying on the law which you cannot keep. So it can only condemn you. In the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 3, God's word says this, uh, For what the law cannot do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So we see the respect of Boaz to honor what was supposed to happen when deciding that he was going to assume the position and marry Ruth. Let's keep going. Ruth chapter 9, or excuse me, chapter 4, verse 9. If you find Ruth chapter 9, uh, your Bible is bad, amen. Uh, Ruth chapter 4, verse 9, here's what God's Word says to us. And Boaz said unto the leaders, or excuse me, said unto the elders, and unto all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought that was all that was Elimelech's, and all that was uh, Chilion's and uh, Melon's, 
of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place? You are witnesses this day, and all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel, and do thou worthily unto Ephratah, and, and be famous in Bethlehem. And let thy house be like the house of Perez, whom uh, Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a son. Or without kinsmen, excuse me. That his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons that hath bore him, or borne him. Look, the legal requirement was met. The legal portion had been completed. The formal process is complete with the transfer of rights of Elimelech's estate over to Boaz, symbolized by the handover of the shoe or the sandal. This act signifies Boaz's new role as the rightful redeemer of the family estate. But it also marks the end of any claim from another. Boaz addresses the assembled witnesses, emphasizing his legitimate acquisition of Elimelech's land and crucially gives him the right to take Ruth's hand, Ruth's hand in marriage. His declaration brings into focus his commitment to preserving the deceased's lineage and ensuring that his name endures. Now look, the people, notice how instantly they act differently toward Ruth. They celebrate Ruth's redemption by calling her woman instead of what? The Moabitess. That's the way they had referred to her throughout this book. They liken her to Leah and to Rachel. And in, those two, in, in this circle, that would have been elevating her status. By the way, the same happens when sinners come forth to be redeemed by Jesus. They are transformed into saints. They become God's children. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, God's Word says this, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Look, now that Ruth has been redeemed, we see the conclusion of this account with marriage and family. The women of Bethlehem celebrate this new life with gratitude. And it reflects on Naomi's previous sorrows, but now she has renewed hope. Their blessing acknowledges that Boaz's role in restoring Naomi's life and in providing her well into her advanced age. They praise God for bringing such a faithful daughter-in-law into Naomi's life, highlighting Ruth's selfless love and her role in continuing the family lineage, which was once thought to be lost with the death of Elimelech and his two sons. Ruth's actions in the birth of her son symbolize both a personal renewal for Naomi and a larger God-planned redemption for their family. Look, when you look at Boaz, you can see Boaz as a sort of Old Testament type Jesus. Now, not at the magnitude that Jesus saves us today, but we can see a picture of the things that Jesus did or what Jesus has done for you and I. Boaz redeemed in two distinct ways. The first, he redeemed life by preserving the line of Elimelech. 
Naomi's deceased husband. The son of Boaz and Ruth was considered to be from his line. So that preserved the family name. Secondly, he redeemed the land. He purchased, he redeemed the family land that had been sold by Naomi and restored it to Elimelech's line. And if Christ is your Redeemer, if you have accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, then understand there's two ways we can look at how He has redeemed us. First, Jesus purchased the Christian with His own blood and keeps us from uh, uh, perishing from sin if we remain faithful, if we have endurance, spiritually speaking. Secondly, we know that there is a parcel of land There is a place that we can stay. There is a place for the redeemed of Christ because we know He includes us that are redeemed in His internal inheritance, which is the new heaven and the new earth. Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, is worthy of yours and my praise and exultation for redeeming us. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, God's Word says this, By Him, therefore, let us offer sacrifice of praise to God continually. Wait a minute. I'm not just supposed to say one time, thank God for saving my soul and be done with it? No. We're supposed to praise God continually. You know, if you ever hear Brother... I pick on Brother West a lot, but I'm going to pick on him in a good way now. If you ever hear Brother West lift up prayer requests, if you ever ask or hear him give a testimony, and it doesn't matter if it's in a... A uh, Sunday morning worship service, it doesn't matter, it matter if it's Sunday school, a Friday night prayer meeting, a Sunday night small group. It does not matter when it is. If Brother West is going to talk about God, the very one of the first things that he will say is, I thank God for saving my soul. Why? Because I believe it's continually on Brother West's mind that God saved him and he didn't have to. Folks, we live in a world that feels like they're entitled to everything. uh, We feel like we're entitled to a good life. We're we're entitled for things to be handed to us. That's the viewpoint that most have. Understand this. God could have said, observe my law and deal with the consequences when you break it. But He didn't. He sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross so that you and I could recognize that we we couldn't keep the law, but we could rely upon Him. God's Word tells us, To offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. Do you regularly have a thankful heart and praise filled speech for the One who redeemed you? Look, I have my last point. I don't want to miss these last few verses. Here's what God's Word says. Ruth chapter 4, verses 16 through 22. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom. And he and became to nurse unto it, and the the women her neighbors gave it a name, saying, "There is a son born to Naomi," and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez beget Hezron, and Hezron beget Ram, and Ram beget Amminadab, and Amminadab beget Nashon, and Nashon beget Salmon, and Salmon beget Boaz, and Boaz beget Obed, and Obed beget Jesse, and Jesse beget David. Now look, I share all that with you because it's through this, these lines, it's through these generations that we see the pedigree of the Messiah. The account of Boaz and Ruth and the birth of their son, this child born through, through Ruth and Boaz, symbolizes the continuation of Naomi's family line and honors her late husband and son. God's Word highlights that this son becomes the grandfather of King David, marking a significant culmination of this story. This genealogy that is given to us at, this, at the end of this book traces the lineage all the way and showcases the pivotal role this family plays in Israel's history. Notably, something that we, I don't think, have discussed so far in this study is that if you look at Boaz's mother, who was Rahab, the woman who once helped Israelite spies, adding even another layer of historical depth to all that this story of Ruth and Boaz gives us. This final detail emphasizes that the redemption journey of Ruth paves the way for the rise of King David, linking the personal redemption 
with national significance because we know that it was through this line that Jesus the Messiah came. In Romans chapter 1 verse 13, God's, or excuse me, verse 3, God's word says this, Concerning His Son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And if it wasn't for Boaz, redeeming Ruth, following God's plan that was outlined, how would, have we have made, how would they have made a way for the Messiah? Look, for those who, can, who are concerned, we'll put all that aside right now. For those who may be concerned that your needs will not be met. The story of Ruth and Boaz is a perfect reminder that if you seek help from the one who actually can provide it, your needs will be met. Understand there is no good enough in the eyes of God. Our reliance must be solely upon Jesus and His surrender and sacrifice on the cross. There is but one Redeemer of the soul, and that is Jesus Christ. Look, listen, especially young people, if you're under the age of 30 this morning, I want you to understand because the world, your friends, everybody will tell you that Christianity is outdated, it's bigoted, it's archaic. It all feeds the funnel of uh, a patriarchal system. It will tell you that it's here to keep... Uh, women and, 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 and minorities down. Look, I want you to understand something. The Bible, uh, God's Word, God's work through humanity is not to oppress you. It's to free you. It's to give you liberty. You line up the Word of God, you line up the Bible with any other faith system in the world. And understand that faith system will tell you that you have to do something. You have to give a certain amount of money. You have to do a certain amount of work. You have to give a certain number of years of service before God would even consider you worthy. You know what the one true God tells you? You're not worthy. But you can follow the Lord Jesus Christ and surrender to Him because He is worthy. And He died a substitutionary death for you. Spiritually speaking, so that you can live eternal. So that you can be one of God's. To me, if we had a faith system that said you had to do, you had to pay money, you had to do certain things to be saved, that is an oppressive system. That is an antiquated system. That is what keep, he keeps people in bondage. But the true living God, no, He provides a way to break those chains, to free you from bondage. And all you have to do is exercise faith. All you have to do is surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There is but one Redeemer of the soul and that is Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, it says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Two weeks ago, we focused on the drifter or backslider by reading through Hosea and seeing the possibility of restoration with God through Jesus. Last week, we focused on the true believer and discussed the heart of our worship and that the true worship that we rely upon or the true worship rather that we engage in should be focused completely on Jesus. And today, we see with the conclusion of the story of Ruth and Boaz and Naomi. That there is possibility for redemption for the unbeliever. And look here, this morning, hey, don't look around, look at me. I do not believe, call me crazy, say I'm naive, do what you want. I do not believe that God lines things up by coincidence. The reason that I have waited so long to finish the book of Ruth, I believe, is because it came down to this portion to where somebody has to recognize that redemption is possible and it's only through the Lord Jesus Christ. So unbeliever, I know you're here this morning. And what I want to tell you is this. There is hope. God loves you. God desires a relationship with you. I don't know what you're waiting on, but I can tell you this. 
I know I'm going to heaven, but I surely hope I'm not going without you. Hell is real. It's not a fairy tale. There is a reason why a single archaeological dig has never disproven the Word of God. There's a reason why no history book truly contradicts the Word of God. There is a reason why the history books say that there's places and events in the Bible that never took place, but after a while they realize and they recognize, oh, actually, the Bible was right. Yet again, understand this. After so many times of the Bible getting it right, you might think there's something to it. And what I do know is I know the Bible is truly inspired, the inspired Word of God. It is inerrant. And if that is true, then that means that if you and I do not surrender our life to the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are going to experience eternity in a place where there is weeping, where there is gnashing of teeth, where we will remember the times and the things and all the bad things that, that have occurred. It's going to play out over and over in our mind. It's not a place that's a party. It's not a place where you'll ever find rest. It's not a place where you'll get any sense of satisfaction. As a matter of fact, it's a place of isolation. And it's a place of eternal torment. But you and I can avoid every bit of that. By simply surrendering our life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you redeemed this morning? If not, I certainly encourage you to cry out to the Lord today. Will you stand across the room if you have the ability? With eyes closed and heads bowed. Father God, for the one or the many in here that are unsaved, I pray that they come forward, that they surrender their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that they recognize that hell is real but so is heaven. And Father, I pray they rely on You. I pray that You call out to them and they respond with a confession of sin and the repentance recognizing they don't need to clean themselves up. They don't need to do anything except trust You by faith. And Father, I pray for the believer in here this morning who may be struggling in some capacity. I pray that they see that their, meet, uh, their needs can be met just as Ruth and Naomi's were. I pray that they recognize that Jesus is their Redeemer and no matter what they're going through, no matter what they're faced with, no matter how much pain and agony they've been in, no matter how much torment that they're struggling, no matter how many problems are stacking up, Father, I pray that they come to You, the only one who can help or, or assist or intervene. Father, I pray that they are faithful to come and pray out to You, not caring about what anybody else in this room is doing or saying or seeing, but Father, I pray they rely on You and I ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.